Hello, I'm Brian McCall, the Editor-in-Chief of Catholic Family News, and we have a really interesting special report for you in this video. Uh, we are going to speak uh, with Mr. John Stanisfer, who is the author of No Bullet Got Me Yet, a recently published biography of Father Emile Copin. Uh, Mr. Stanifer is a, a native Kansan. Uh, he went to the University of Kansas, and he is a, a screen uh, play writer and author. He's written over 20 different screenplays. And he, as I mentioned, he has most recently published uh, this book about Father Emile Copin, from the, originally from the Diocese of Wichita. Uh, we'll get into some more information about him in, in a moment. So welcome to Catholic Family News, Mr. Stanifer. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, great. Well, um, why don't we start off by, if you could just tell us how you became interested in the story of, uh, you know, a priest who died almost 70 years ago uh, over in, you know, thousands of miles away from Kansas in, in Korea. What, how did you come to know about his story and what attracted your attention? My, my father was a history professor at Kansas University for uh, 50 years, and so I've always had a deep love of Kansas history. My parents and grandparents were from Wichita, and so I was well familiar with a lot of Kansas history. You know, United and uh, that, that combined with the fact that I joined the Kansas Army National Guard for six years while I was attending uh, school led to a deep interest in military history, and so. I always wanted to write a screenplay about some significant battle, probably in World War II or the Civil War. I even wrote a couple of Vietnam War scripts. Uh, and then uh, I never thought about the Korean War at, at all. I had no connection to it personally. And it wasn't until Father Capon was uh, posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor in 2013. It immediately caught my attention. And I said out loud before the 20 minute ceremony was over that I'm going to write a screenplay about that guy and it's going to be bigger than myself. I, I feel like I was, I was called to do it. I was anointed. I, I, I don't know what else to say. And I immediately went, I was in uh, Malibu, California. I flew back to uh, Kansas in met up with the, the Pond family, some veterans, and mainly with the Catholic Diocese of Wichita, who approved my uh, project without having any knowledge about movies or how they get made or whatever, which is a long, arduous process, as you can imagine. And I was so moved by the story that I wrote a 171-page screenplay, which is about a three-hour movie, within wow. months. And uh, but then then I was stuck with it. This is 2014. And you can imagine how hard it is for an unknown writer to get a big budget Korean War film made uh, without a movie star. And so that languished for years. Everyone said the story was great, but nobody wanted to put up, you know, that kind of money for it without attachments, you know, big movie star, big director. And so. I got so much research from Wichita, the Catholic diocese, that they encouraged me to write a biography on him. And so I started on that and ended up with about 500 pages. And what you see in the book was cut down to 350 pages. So it, it was a lot longer. <laughs> and, wow. uh, but the book was going nowhere too. And so one of the miracles of Father Capon is in March of uh, 2021, you know, his remains were positively identified after 70 years being listed as MIA. He had been at rest in the Hawaii National Cemetery called the Punch Bowl since 1954. He wasn't disinterred for DNA analysis until 2019. Mm. We're, we're going back to 1954. That's how big the backlog was. And so the news of his uh, identification, positive, uh, you know, rocked the world. And they had a, 
His funeral was an amazing service in September of 2021. And uh, immediately I got an agent because now I had closure to the story. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Because yeah, a lot yeah of you had an ending. Think, you, had, you had an ending uh, to it, right. A lot of people don't think about it, POWMIA's situations and their families because the family had, there was no update for them to say that progress was even being made. That, that for all they knew, he was still lying in a shallow grave in uh, North Korea. Wow. So it, it, it just makes a super exciting story. And, and you know, when he was awarded the military history and the circumstances of his death uh, brought on new uh, with a, a new witness and other witness statements hmm. caused so that they are now applying for martyrdom status which as you can imagine is extremely rare yes and, uh, yes and, and uh i i think he deserves martyrdom status in which case sainthood would be advanced uh you know much faster <clears throat> right well, as our, our viewers probably guess, Father Capon served as a chaplain in, in the U.S. military. Uh, our viewers may be familiar with this rather famous, I think at least, picture of uh, Father. Uh, it's on. I have actually a holy card uh, oops, with it, uh, with this picture. Uh, and it's him uh, in, in uh, Korea. I, I don't know if I recall where exactly, if you know where that, this picture of him, where in Korea this was taken. or I, I, I could tell you everything about that photo. It was, taken, okay. it was taken October 7th, 1950, just days before uh, the 1st Cavalry Division got to go ahead to enter North Korea. So the photo was taken at Musan, which is just below uh, <clears throat> Seoul, Korea, while they were waiting to be get the word on moving, mm. uh, mo mo moving north, because, you know, crossing the 38th parallel was supposed to be the line in the sand to... Uh, where we, where we thought China might enter the war, and ultimately they did. And I, I got to say, that's that's the most iconic chaplain photo probably of all time. I, there's yeah, no question yes. about it. No, I, I, I agree. I agree with you. Um, well, this wasn't actually Father Capon's first time as a military chaplain. Uh, I, I learned reading your book, he actually served, did his time in, in World War II uh, in the uh, Asian theater, uh, of the the Pacific Theater of, of World War II, uh, so how did he end up back in the army in, in another war? It's it's extremely interesting. As as you can see from the book, it's quite obvious yeah. that he wanted to join the war effort because of Pearl Harbor. It, 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 as, as you know from history, the entire country was uh, swept up in the war and. Yes. The amount of people that went into service was tremendous. Father Capon wanted to be one of them. He was, you know, that was just, you know, December 1941. He was only ordained in 1940. And he was the, the pastor in Pilsen, Kansas, which is an extremely small town. It's, just, mm. it's it's barely qualifies as a village. It has no businesses or streetlights or anything. And uh, his, his bishop was reluctant because there was already reports that, you know, ch chaplains were in grave danger uh, going overseas, which was true. A lot of chaplains died in World War II. And so he was declined saying that he was more needed at mm -hmm. the local parishes in Wichita and, and surrounding areas around Pilsen. So he abided by his bishop, but you can see in the book, he wrote passionate letters, feeling the call to serve the nation and uh, he was allowed to become an auxiliary chaplain for two years, which is a volunteer service, non-military, at Harrington Air Base, which was which was near him. So that that almost qualifies him for serving, you know, two years in military service as a civilian. And he, uh, and then after D-Day, which you know was the biggest news of the war at the time. You can look at the dates of the letters, and he knew he had to go serve in World War II, and he deeply implored his bishop to send him. He, his bishop allowed him then to go to uh, basic training in the chaplain school at Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and he, uh, 
1945, so in 1945, after graduating, he was sent to the CBI Theater, China, Burma, India, and uh, he traveled all over the place. There are thousands of miles by plane and by jeep uh, in Burma and India, rescuing missions that had been decimated by the Japanese. And he even gave a eulogy for FDR when he passed in, I, I believe, March of 1945. And 9,000 people attended his mass in New Delhi, India, uh, honoring uh, FDR at the time. No, that that was a part of the book I, uh, particularly spoke to me. I really liked that. Uh, obviously, his his mission was to care for the soldiers, uh, you know, in in his uh, in the army. That's what the chaplain's for. But when he was over in the CBI theater, I found it really interesting that he kind of was taking care of, um, you know, these native populations who had lost their clergy through the through the war. You know, it could have been easy to say, "Hey, I'm in the army. I got my job to do over here," but. You know, just amazing stories you collected of, of people in India and other is, places saying, it, you know, how grateful they were that he came. It, it, is, it is amazing because you can see earlier in the book, he desired to be a missionary from a young age. And so yes. he felt he, could, he he was literally doing the work of work of both. Yes. Uh, so so after so you asked me about how we re-entered the yeah. war, then uh, at, at the war's end, he uh got a degree in uh, uh, education at Catholic University in 1947, but it was the rise of communism that frightened him more than uh, Hitler. And he, he made it well known and, and it was clear what was going on, the Berlin airlift and, and uh, the, the rise of Stalin in Eastern Europe, they weren't, they weren't backing off. And, uh, and North and South Korea were backed by North Korea was backed by Mao and by Stalin as well. And uh, so he again implored his bishop that he had to serve his country uh, over the local parish again. And uh, he was, so he re-enlisted in 1948 and was sent to Fort Bliss. And then uh, Christmas 1949 was his last, can you believe it, his last uh, supper with his family it was Christmas 1949. He was then sent to Korea and uh, North Korea invaded in June of 1950 and he was uh, immediately deployed to with, with the uh, 1st Cavalry Division hmm. uh, which is the anniversary of it. That was June 18th, 1950. 10,000 members landed in uh, the bottom tip of South Korea called the Pusan perimeter where all the refugees had been streaming down. He, uh, Kapan was the eighth regiment chaplain of the first cavalry division. <laughs> and, and that's where, that's where the book really takes off because they, yes. one battle after another, it was relentless, brutal fighting. Every bit as brutal as anything that happened in the Pacific theater of world war two. <laughs> Well, before we get back to the, the sort of military side and his great heroic virtue, I, I do want to come back to talk about Pills in Kansas, where he, he initially started as a priest. And again, our, our viewers might think, oh, a little town in Kansas sounds like an easy, easy setup, right, for a priest. But but it was interesting in the book, you explained it was it was a complicated situation, even though it was a small town. Uh, he had come from a, a, a group of immigrants from Bohemia. There was a real generational shift going on that created a lot of tensions. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about what he had to deal with in in those early years? It was it was very strong. There was a they were Czech Bohemian immigrants. They came over starting the eighteen uh, for, around the eighteen seventies, and they immediately said on the, the it's a farming community. So uh, there, there's a town, called, it's in Marion County, Kansas. The town of Marion, which is several thousand people, was a, about five miles down the road from Pilsen. So that's where he spent a, a lot of time too, as well. And uh, they were very devo devoted, devoted to their Catholic faith, faith. And they erected, you can see in the book and pictures, this uh, Catholic church that went up in 1916 which was about the year that Capon was baptized in the church. And it's it's still there to this day. And it's absolutely gorgeous. It's a, the, the spire is five stories tall. 
and it's it's so interesting when you drive to Pilsen, you can see the spire of the church from miles away. Mm. It's right in the middle of open farmland. It's very interesting. And Capon's boyhood home is across the street that it was moved there, but I went to the spot where it originally was, which is about a mile away from the church, and from the second story of his childhood home, you could see the church out his window. Mm. And uh, he desired to be a priest probably since he was seven years old. And uh, his diary wrote about, it's, it's interesting that his diaries talked about All Souls Day and All Saints Day and the importance of the saints. So if you just listed all the saints that were in Capon's life during his time, it's quite an extensive list. Uh, the, the church was named after St. John of Nepomuncin, uh, St. John of Nep, he was the, the patron saint of the confession. And uh, so that's that's the earliest exposure to a saint that Capon would have seen was that, that church, or excuse me, that, that saint whose statue of course is at the church and, and, and other saints as well. And he evoked uh, many other saints during the course of the war and in his uh, homilies. And uh, th uh, another thing that you're not going to understand from the book is how much he wrote. He wrote a lot of theology and mm -hmm. uh, in his class notes and in cemetery. I'm, I'm talking thousands of pages with mm. real tiny handwriting, too. And so uh, I hope to be involved one day where we'll publish his uh, writings, which is going to be a much deeper theological work than a, uh, a, a generalized biography. He studied five or six languages. He spoke Latin, uh, Bohemian, German. He took Greek. And then, believe it or not, when he was in Japan, he started taking Japanese. Mm. I, I mean, he was a very learned man. This is just, it's highly unusual that he would become a front lines chaplain almost to the point of being a fellow you know combat medic who that, that, it, that's where and yeah is. picking up on that again some people might think oh a chaplain again not a, not that dangerous you're not but um to maybe illustrate kind of how dangerous it was why don't you just a little bit about this other i think iconic picture that's behind you of this sort of broken pipe just give us an example what what, what happened to his pipe in this picture this, <laughs> this so just so everybody is clear, this is a colorization that I did right. uh, from a, a, a black and white photograph. And it was so bright that you can't even make out the cross on his helmet because it's about midday. Ah. And so when I colorized it first, I, I accentuated the cross so you could be clear that he was a chaplain. And unfortunately, we're not certain where the photo was taken. It's probably around Seoul, Korea, around the time of the other uh, Jeep photo. And, and that, by the way, is an actual color photo. And uh, by the time he got to North Korea, there were like fish tails, many stories about his pipe getting shot out of his mouth. <laughs> so a, a sniper shot out of his mouth. And you can see the white medics tape that he wrapped to the stem of the pipe. So he, he's holding a pipe that's basically half the size. And he's smiling like, you missed me. And, and wow. he wrote home, of course, you know, to his parents, in one of his last letters home, no bullet got me yet, but a mach machine gunner sprayed us with bullets, but we jumped in the ditch too quick, quickly. And he always said somebody at home was praying for us because he never got hit. And so I, 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 I believe most readers will take this in, this in this regard that no bullet got me yet stands as a philosophy of faith from a kind of a mm. Kansas turn of phrase. Yeah. And, and that's why the book is called The, R the Relentless Faith of Father Capon. He said, until you kill me, I'm never going to stop. Yeah. And. Indeed, he was shot at probably 10,000 times, mortar rounds, tank rounds, artillery rounds, uh, machine guns, uh, everyday rifles, and burp guns, which are like the uh, Russian or Chinese version of Tommy guns, 80-round ammo drums. They call them burp guns because the rate of fire was so high that it, would, uh, it made a burp sound. 
Wow. And that meant a ton of lead was coming at you. A ton of lead. And these people did not have, and these soldiers did not have bulletproof vests. Can you imagine? <laughs> the lead was flying everywhere. Everywhere was lead. And they were frequently overrun in the early days of the war. And so that's what made it more dangerous than other battles where you might be advancing because the, the North Koreans and then later the Chinese, they only attacked at night to, in order to avoid air power. And so that allowed them to infiltrate the entire area around where the, our units were and overwhelm them with numbers. Some Many battles in the early days, you could be shooting forwards or backwards. You didn't know where it was coming from. And you're shooting in the dark. <laughs> so it's, wow. it's horrific, horrific circumstances. Well, you mentioned the white cross. You mentioned the white cross on his uh, helmet that we can see here, uh, which is meant, really, in international understanding, to to show respect for the chaplains that combatants yep. would realize. But uh, maybe tell us a little bit how the the North Koreans, the Chinese, didn't really show too much respect for the chaplains. They really well, as as you know, they're uh, you know devoted to Mao and yeah. are 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 the most atheist ethnicity group probably on the planet. Yeah. And so, and, and that was further underlined by his arguments with the, uh, with the indoctrination officers in the POW camp, where you come to understand where the Chinese are coming from. And so they, they did not like chaplains because they were <clears throat> pious and, and, and infused spirit into the, into the men and that was that that's the most dangerous soldier to them is, is someone that's uh, giving them the moral imperative uh, the, the reason for being there that they're fighting for a good cause and uh it also the cru crucifixes and and crosses spooked them spooked mm. them in battle and it spooked them in the in the uh, pow camps so that they frequently shied away from punishment or torment because they felt they were in the presence of a supernatural power. I, I, I truly believe that. So, and, and it was demonstrated many times. And, but that also led to persecution. And they would, oddly enough, they, they let him keep his helmet liner, but not the steel pot of the helmet in the POW camp. So he, he walked around the camp with a, with a helmet liner, which is, you know, basically cardboard, but it also had a, a crucifix on it and they mm. would throw rocks at him. Uh, he was punished several times, pretty severely, you know, holding a log over your head with your clothes stripped in absolutely below zero freezing weather while they threw buckets of water on you. I mean, it's, <laughs> wow. it's a sure way to give somebody pneumonia, you know. In the, and, uh, the North Korean winter, definitely. Well, well, one of the things you're, you obviously mentioned he's in the POW camp, but one of the things in your book, you collect a lot of stories and impressions from uh, soldiers he fought with and then also fellow prisoners. And, and one of the things that struck me is how much respect uh, these soldiers, you know, showed to him. And obviously, and not just as was interesting, not just Catholics, um, but you know, people who were not Catholic, not even Christian in many ways. So, uh, Editor, do you have a particularly favorite story or, or instance of, you know, what what people who were with him, with Father Capone, uh, felt a about, how they felt about him? A absolutely. I, th there's so many great stories in this book. I, I can't even tell you. Uh, yeah. It's been, it, Father Capone has been called the greatest war story of all time. And I, if, if, if you've seen any recent reviews, some people are called one of the greatest stories of all time. Yeah. And so I got this book published. I'm, I'm not, uh, it's my first book. So it wasn't published because of my name. It was published because of his name. But there's a great story. So I told you they, uh, the first cab division in October of uh, 1950, MacArthur authorized them and, and Truman to uh, advance into North Korea and try to seal off the entire country at the border of the Yalu River. So they took Pyongyang, that's the North Korean capital, October 20th of 1950. And there, 
the, the North Koreans had disappeared because, you know, uh, MacArthur landed the Marines at, in Chon in September of 1950. We cut the North Koreans in half and they were decimated. They, they fled north and there was very few North Koreans to fight in October of 1950. Very interesting story there. So thousands of supplies and men just poured into Pyongyang from uh, British forces and, and American forces. Uh, the, the Marines were on the other side of the of the Korean Peninsula. This was mostly the Army and First Cav Division. And uh, oh, it's 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 such a profound story. So Bill Richardson was one of the men that was in the Third Battalion, Eighth Regiment, who was fighting alongside Capon. Had met him on several occasions throughout their push north. And when they took Pyongyang so easily, everyone thought the war was over. And they were saying, how do you load a ship? We're going to have a celebration in Japan and we'll be, the war's over and we'll be sent home. And then word spread that Bob Hope was coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. So October 26, sure enough, you know, Bob Hope and Marilyn Maxwell popped out of an airplane to do a USO show. And you can imagine he's the most famous entertainer probably in the world at the time. And so eight to 10,000 uh, airmen and soldiers, whatnot, showed up at the airfield for that show. That, that's a pretty big crowd for being in enemy territory. Yeah. You know, eight to 10,000 people. Well, guess who did not attend? And that was Father Capon. And he had trepidations. He had concerns. There was rumors that the Chinese were gonna enter the war, but unfortunately that those warnings weren't heeded. And so he told Bill Richardson and his men, Bill Richardson was not Catholic, uh, but he had great admiration for chaplains. And so he said, well, I don't really care about the show. I don't think this is the time to celebrate. I'm gonna hold mass in some dusty cold room in a hospital in a room in uh, Pyongyang. And, and it gave pause to Bill Richardson who, you know, I'm, I'm sure he was fond of Bob Hope as much as anybody. He's not Catholic. And he told us men, well, I'm going to attend mass with Father Capon wow. instead of going to the show. And he actually convinced several of his uh, of his uh, squad to join Capon. And so Father Capon gave a mass, which, oh, my gosh, I, I wish I could have been there and seen that. He gave a simple mass in a small room, probably two, two dozen people, two dozen soldiers at most were there while... You could hear artillery in the distance still going off, and there's 8,000 people cheering Bob Hope just right down the road. I, I mean, that's mm. as if, and so you can see in the book, Bill Richardson said, I'm not a religious man, but I was that day. He was so moved by Capon, and Capon's trepidations proved true. The day after Bob Hope's show, they got ordered north to infamy at the Battle of Unsan where they were almost all nearly wiped out. I mean, you can't, you can't make this, this stuff up. And another interesting thing about what people observed in his faith in Pyongyang was at one point, you know, he was there from October 20th to October 27th. At one point, people were looking for him and said, I, I can't find father. What, you know, does anybody know where he is? And two different officers found him in a room sitting on a wooden stool in the with little light and freezing cold and he had in his it's just amazing he had a box with about 500 dog tags of all the first calf members that had been killed pushing north he had all their dog tags. he didn't have time to uh assign them to the bodies yet like I believe they had two dog tags on them and one was left with the body. The other was left for the chaplain and for the army to notify next of kin. And so alone, Father Capon was found in a room writing letters to next of kin who died uh, in order that they could take Pyongyang. And you could imagine there was blood all over the, the dog tags. They'd been blown up and shot to, to just tremendously. And both of these officers, can I help you in any way? Can I help you write this? And he said, he just, no, well, this is the job of the chaplain. This wow. is the job of the chaplain. And the, and they they left the room. They didn't know. <laughs> he was he was so 
wow, he was so thoughtful of others and, and, and knew full well that a handwritten note to the next kid's family is a heck of a lot more meaningful than a horrible, you know, telegram, which they yes. also received. And, and, well, and to this mention- day, by the way, I, I hope that somebody turns up one of those letters because we don't have a single one. Oh. They're sitting in attics. They're sitting in, you know, poor family members that were KIAs in Korean War that received personal letters from a future saint. And we, we haven't found a, a single one that's turned up. <laughs> well, that's, maybe... That's, Maybe somebody watching this video, well, maybe somebody watching this video will find one in their oh, I, their father's attic or something. Check, but check, your, check the letters from your families yes. from the 1950s, uh, please. Well, and I want to mention that that to me, when you mentioned that letter, because um, I read uh, more about Father Bacon, uh, Capon before I uh, read Shepherd in Combat Boots, but when I read your book, what I found really unique about your book is it doesn't just tell his story, but it incorporates all throughout the book letters of his. And sadly, there's none of these um, letters notifying next of kin, but many letters of his back home to his bishop, to different family members, and then all these other firsthand accounts of people like Bill Richardson, other people that uh, he knew, uh, and letters about him and to him. And so all of this what I call kind of primary source material is, is to me what really distinguished your book. And I, I found fascinating. Th- th- thank you so much. And I also found uh, declassified records in the national archives. So whenever the book says war diary, that's it's the equivalent to what they call an after action report. Mm. And so the war diary in there in conjunction with all the letters and, and eyewitness uh, accounts that you put in, I, I simply put it in chronological order. I, I, I used to joke with people, you know what, I, I think I can account for what Father Capon did every day of the war. I can tell you the movements that they were that they were at, that were what they did. And then uh, another, uh, another quick story is, you know, he rescued the body of a pilot that had crashed the uh, F-51 Mustang near him. And uh, the pilot had died, but while he was being rescued, uh, the plane was on fire. It's got six 50 caliber machine guns in each, in both wings, and the ammo started cooking off. And he got hit in the elbow by a ricochet. <clears throat> then he came under enemy fire as the rest of this. He was by himself for a considerable amount of time, and and then he was. Uh, and then the rest of his men from the first cab left the convoy to go over a, a couple of miles to where this this plane had crashed in enemy territory and he rescued his body. And I, I, I identify him in the book through records of planes that were crashed, which they have, you know, uh, intimate records of this. And he was returned home and buried in St. Louis, Missouri. And I, I mentioned this story and I mentioned it in the book a few months later, I'm sure you've heard of Thomas Hudner being awarded the medal of honor for trying to rescue his wingman, Jesse Brown. It became the basis for the movie devotion and the book devotion by Adam Makos, which is, mm. it's, that's a great, great book. Adam mm. Makos is, is a fantastic writer. And well, I, oh, he wasn't well, able mentioned... to rescue the body. So Thomas Hudner was awarded the Medal of Honor. Capon's actions were virtually the same thing as Thomas Hudner, but n- nobody put him up for another medal. And he just wrote about it in one letter, and that's the only way that we know that it that it happened. That's it's, it's almost a Medal of Honor worthy uh, award for those actions alone. Well, and you mentioned that uh, he was awarded uh, posthumously the the Medal of Honor in 2013. And maybe for maybe our viewers who are not as familiar with the military military history, how how common is it for a military chaplain to receive that highest highest honor? <laughs> Can you see that? Yes. Nine fingers. Nine <laughs> fingers. Chap- chaplains have been awarded the Medal of Honor only nine times in our nation's history. Nine times. Father Capon is the only Medal of Honor chaplain awarded <coughs> for the Korean War. Mm. So it's extremely rare. Uh, and then there's two or three uh 
from Vietnam and, and the rest would have been World War II. Wow, that's, again, a, 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 a lot of chaplains were killed in the Korean War, too. Even the, the secular world recognizing in his, his heroic virtue and that eventually led him to his death, as we said, in, in a North Korean prison camp. But he, he, he left, he went there serenely, like many of the stories of the, the martyrs throughout all history, encouraging the, the people around him to keep their faith and to, to not lose hope. Constantly. Uh, constantly, as he, he went to what he knew was going to be his, cer his most certain death in, in this horrible facility they called a hospital, but which really people didn't return from. But, uh, you know, thank you for, for making his story better known, supporting his cause. Hopefully one day uh, he'll receive a higher honor than the, the uh, Medal of Honor from the it's, church. It's and they'll recognize recognize it's, it's, his... It's overdue, and everyone in yeah. the Capon community will tell you the same thing. They've been calling him a saint the 1950s since the yes. day that they learned of his story that and, and i'll tell you another thing he was put up for the medal of honor a long time ago right after the war and guess who declined to give him the medal of honor who dwight eisenhower wow <laughs> president eisenhower declined to give a fellow kansan the medal of honor and it's not understood why i have the letters that it was rejected hmm. But it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, so 60 some years after that, it ends up back at the top of the uh, Pentagon list because of the efforts of our Kansas senators and representatives at the time, one of whom was was uh, Mike Pompeo. <laughs> and they, ah. they, pushed for the, they pushed for the Medal of Honor in the early 2000s. And there's great writing for the Wichita Eagle newspaper uh, that just you know, page after page telling all, all, all these stories, bringing the light to the his award winning uh, writing. And, and, and that ultimately led to the decision to give a posthumous medal of honor. And you probably know the Pentagon is not does not like to revisit old cases like this. Yeah. So how he got ahead is, again, it's, it's, it's another miracle. And, and by yes. the way, they're they're making a they're making a, a, a statue of him to go in the Kansas State House. Uh, they're taking mm -hmm. bids right now to build a, a statue. It'll be installed next year. It was wow. una unanimously approved by the Kansas uh, House and Senate. Fantastic. Well, if you'd like to read more of these incredible stories and firsthand accounts, again, the name of the book, No Bullet Got Me Yet, The Relentless Faith of Father Capon. Uh, you, you can certainly buy it different places. It is available on Amazon, but I uh, definitely recommend you go to uh, this website, which we'll have linked in the uh, description, uh, which is the website dedicated to the cause of Father Capon under their merchandise section. Uh, yep. This book is there. I don't know if you still have any, but I, when I ordered mine, it actually came as a signed copy uh, uh, from you. So I don't know if they still I, have any signed copies. Yeah, if, if you get the book through the Wichita Diocese, it's fathercapon.org, the, the merchandise section. The proceeds go to the cause for canonization. And I, I signed book plates for all those copies. So you'll get a signed copy of Father Capon's uh, prayer card and a custom bookmark. Uh, which makes that place more special, I, I suppose, than the others. I'm, I'm very proud to say it. I wish my father could see this. The book is now in 290 libraries, uh, coast to coast, including the Department of Defense uh, library system. And I, I, could, I couldn't be, I mean, I, I didn't even think about library copies going out when you write a book. Uh, you know, you're thinking about bookstores and Amazon and all that. And uh, so it's, it's all over the place. So that's the first edition. So when you move closer to canonization, uh, be sure to look for the second edition of the book, which hopefully will be out by uh, later this year. And it'll have an update on the canonization process or the status. And it will have an update hopefully on our movie too, which is uh, it's still in development. We're working on getting funding and, and talent attached right now. Wonderful. Well, definitely better to give your money to, uh, the cause, uh, the people oh, supporting absolutely. this cause, then, uh, then Mr. Bezos over there at Amazon. But, uh, <laughs> but wonderful. Again, thank you. And we're, we look forward and, and to support your, and support your local bookstores too. Yes, definitely. Well, we certainly look forward to that second edition and hopefully God willing, uh, a major film 
uh, production of his story. It's, it certainly would make uh, for a thrilling uh, an inspiring uh, film as well as the book. So thank you for, for bringing this and for our, for our viewers is really a wonderful story of a, a, a not only a extraordinary bravery, but a priest committed to the mass, committed to missionary work, really a martyr. It, uh, I agree with you. I think a martyr to the mass, to bring the mass and sacraments, extreme unction to uh, people thousands and thousands of miles from the Kansas fields where, where he grew up. And, you know, he gave his life in in defending the mass and the sacraments uh, the way he did. So thank you. And we appreciate uh, your time with us and encourage our, our viewers to uh, go look for the book and uh, keep looking for the movie. So thank you. And uh, Father Capon, pray for us. Father Capon, pray for us. And the story's not done yet. We're it's 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 getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm.